listen carefully and listen well, for this too is the word of the Lord. So it comes to us in the book of Isaiah, <coughs> chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> Isaiah 2, 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning <coughs> Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light the Lord. Amen. And then from Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark Iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. And with the Lord... There is steadfast love, and with him there is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let's pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing unto you. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer, you who take the name Emmanuel, God, come now to be with us. We ask it in Christ's name. Uh, waiting. Waiting. I think that's how Joy ended her prayer, right? That's a, that's a theme embedded in a couple of those hymns, one of which I hadn't heard before is the, the Advent hymn, uh, which is really wonderful. Maybe we'll sing that one again. Um, yeah, waiting. None of us are particularly good at it. And I'll tell you who's really bad at it is Spencer McKee, my, my two-year-old. <clears throat> so this time of year is always... Um, really wonderful for us. So uh, Thanksgiving, my dad's sister, my Aunt Joyce, and Uncle Bob, and cousins Amory, Claire, and Emma travel from all over the place uh, to come to be with us. And so we celebrate Thanksgiving together, and then we celebrate Claire's birthday, and then we celebrate Christmas all together in a span of a couple days. And so yesterday, last night, was our time to celebrate Christmas. So we all have some gifts to exchange and some things we've picked out for one another. And Spencer, like, really understood what was happening. <laughs> like, <laughs> presents, the possibility of opening them up, of getting things, of helping others. And so she was, all right, it's just making me anticipate, you know, Christmas in our own home when, when there's a couple more things for her to open. Um, so I have to wait for that, too. But she was having to wait her turn, right? That's a challenge. So she got to go first. Youngest goes first. So she opened the first thing, and she turned immediately to the next <laughs> present and was ready to tear in. did his bump and no, 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 you have to wait. She was confused for a minute. Didn't like that so much. Then she realized, oh, well, other people will let me help them open their present. <laughs> right? And she also somehow, after a couple rounds, figured out that if she helped other people open their presents, she could open hers faster. <laughs> and so she would get a bag, and she was just pulling stuff out, wasn't even handing it to the person, was just getting it out of the bag and then moving on to the next one. 
she was not particularly good at waiting. Um, that has been a, a, a theme maybe for us as I was reflecting on it a little bit. Just for our family and with, and with children, uh, children aren't, aren't great at waiting. Um, a few weeks ago, we had the, the, the fun opportunity to go for a couple days when they were out of school to, the, to Lexington, to Kentucky, to the Kentucky Horse Park, which I did as a kid with my grandparents. And then this time we took my children with their grandparents. And it was great, but it was five and a half hours away. Can you imagine how many times I heard that question, are we there yet, right? Are we there yet? Are we there? When are we going to be there? I'm tired of waiting. I don't like to wait. So kids, right, have this at issue. But I would say the rest of us, you know, maybe we're just big kids because we're not that good at waiting either. Don't know if you noticed this, but Thursday was Thanksgiving, a day set aside to, to kind of to give thanks for our lives, to give thanks to the Lord. And then the, the next day was Black Friday. Like we, we are so thankful for all that God has provided for us. Now let's go buy some more, right? And now today is the first Sunday in Advent. And tomorrow is Cyber Monday, right? Go get some more stuff. You don't have to go to a store now. You can just order it online. Even faster. You don't even have to wait. You just order it get it. So we're living into this season of waiting in a, in, a, in, a, in a culture that doesn't particularly help us to do that that well. And yet, we're called to wait. Advent is this season of waiting. Um, I think one, one thing that kids can help us to do in their lack of waiting is to show us how to wait with an objective in mind. Right? Because they do not forget the goal. If they want to get the present, they will ask you 800 times for the present. They don't, they'll go do something else, but they come right back. They come right back. They come, they're good at recentering on that thing that they desire, on the thing they long for. You know, it's the present that Spencer's opening. It's the destination. Are we there yet? It's waiting for family to arrive. Are they here yet? Are they, how long? They'll go play, come back. How long? Are they here yet? There's this ability to, to refocus again and again and again. And of course, we're all going to get distracted, you know, waiting for Christ, waiting for Christmas. And yet, like children, we too are invited to this ability to refocus and to shape our vision and our hope and fix it yet again on the Lord Jesus. Advent is this time between, between Christ's first coming and his final coming. So the way you, part of the way you look forward and anticipate and wait for his coming at the end of time is to look back at his first coming. That's what we're going to do right now. Um, we're going to look at some examples that, that give us an insight into how should we wait. You could think of the whole Old Testament as that, anticipation of Christ's coming. So there's plenty of material there, right? Uh, so just maybe read, that's why we're in Isaiah and Psalms today. Because we're looking at the Old Testament, these people who are waiting for Christ's arrival in the Advent. Um, so let's do that. We're going to look at the world and Israel and Zechariah and Elizabeth and Simeon and Anna and Mary. Just as examples of, of how we might be invited deeper into the season of waiting and learn to do it well. Um, so first, I want us to think about, well, the world. The world is waiting in its own way. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved the world. Jesus is for the world. God so loves the world. The world is actually, whether they know it or not, waiting for this one. The world waits. Um, and the way that the scriptures articulate that waiting on the, from the world is it focuses in on this promise that God makes to Abraham. Abraham, the man whom God called to go out from his home and be sent to a land that he would show him. Uh, Abraham, the one to whom God promised a family that would be like the stars in the sky, as numerous as the sands by the shore, and who said that through his family, the entire world, all families of the world, would be blessed. So the world longs and waits for Jesus, the one who's made it. And we see in the scriptures, Abraham 
inviting us into this understanding of how Israel itself, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob wrestles with God by the river Jabbok and receives a new name. Remember that from a few weeks ago? Israel. And Israel is waiting. Israel on behalf of the world waits. And through Israel, the whole world will be blessed. The world waits. Israel waits. Uh, the way that Romans articulates this in the New Testament is after Christ has come, we still wait for the fullness of that kingdom to arrive, to, Christ, to, to be able to see Christ face to face. And Romans says that the creation groans with eager longing, waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. Those who are bound up in Christ, those who have through Christ become children of God, sons of God being a particular uh, theological term, meaning like the angels, meaning those through whom God is going to govern the world. The world longs for us who have been united to Christ to be revealed in all our fullness and the fullness of the kingdom, because then what will happen? All things will be right. We're not trying to govern the world through our own selfish and, and, and me-focused desires, but now we find our rightful place in the ordering of God's good creation and kingdom. And so the creation groans for that, Longs for that. I mean, look at the, if you want to see the creation groaning, look at the news or go to like a slightly angry blog on the internet. There it is. Right? The world groans, longs for things to be set right. So we can wait like the world. I don't want us to be so caught up in... Trying to make the Christmas season so joyful and perfect. There's all that, there's always that pressure. It's a perfect Christmas. It's a perfect gift for the children. It's a, it's a perfect gathering with family. It's a, everything goes just right. I don't want us to get so caught up in that that we forget that part of the way that we wait is to groan, is to lament that things actually aren't right in the world. That things are broken down. That things aren't perfect yet. Advent is a, is a time and a space for that. Not to avoid it. Not to ignore it. Not to try to get around it. But to, to offer that lament up to God. We too groan and long for things to be set right. Do that this year. There's plenty of places you know, in the world, but in your own life too, I, I'm sure of it. So let's do that. As we wait, let us also be aware of the need and the goodness of lament during the season. But we can also wait like Israel. Isaiah, in particular, our passage today, is looking to a time when the mountain of the house of the Lord will be highest above all things. That, that means like it is primary. It is the highest, highest place. There's lots of places in the world that we look to for direction, for guides, for purpose. Lots of different objectives or goals, like the present under the tree for Spencer, or whatever it may be. We look at lots of things. But eventually, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be lifted up as the highest thing. And it will be good because all people will learn from and be shaped by the law of the Lord. All will be set right. Even the nations, all the nations will come and flock to the mountain of the Lord that they too might learn from God and be shaped according to his purpose. So Israel, through the voice of Isaiah, is longing for this, is anticipating this, but also waiting for it now in the midst of time. Uh, waiting for it like Abraham had to wait. One day, the whole world will be blessed through your family. Like David, uh, who was promised that one day a king descended from your line will sit on the throne of Israel forever. Christ, right? Um, that one day, this king will institute God's rule, and it will look like what Isaiah is talking about, where everyone comes and sees the mountain of the house of the Lord as the highest thing. Israel waits on behalf of the world in a slightly different way, being guided, being chastened, being led astray. The whole Testament's full of those examples. And yet, like a child being called back again to look once more at the highest thing, at the mountain of the house of the Lord, at Zion, where God's holy rule uh, extends. And then within Israel, we see some examples uh, of people, not just the world, that's a big thing, not just Israel as a nation, like this, that's a large and complicated thing, but also through particular people. Uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth, remember their story? 
Zechariah as, uh, as the priest, uh, who as husband to Elizabeth, they, they don't have any children in their later years. And so Zechariah goes in, it's his assigned task this year to go into the Holy of Holies, the one time to go in, to enter in. He's been waiting all year for this, and a bit nervously probably, because it was tradition that the priest would tie, have a rope tied around his leg in case death by holiness occurs, unless he, he enters into the holy space of God and he is not prepared, he is not ready. Mercy uh, does not meet him in that way. And so they tie this rope in so nobody else has to go into the Holy of Holies. They can just drag him out. He goes in, he's been waiting. You can imagine him waiting for this, waiting as the knot is tied. He goes in to the Holy of Holies this one time of the year. It's his assigned task. And he does meet with the Lord. And God reveals to him that he and Elizabeth will have a son. And this son shall be the one to pave the way for the Messiah, the Christ, whom Israel, whom the whole world waits for. It's now, this time is now, it is coming, it is coming. But he doubts and he says, how is this going to happen? And then he has to wait a long time, nine months, until he can speak. Because God says, you're not going to speak again until this son is born. You shall call his name John. And so Zechariah waits. He waits first in doubt, but then he waits in faith. He waits in humility. He waits chastened. We can look at Zechariah and learn how to wait. Elizabeth, his wife, goes, well, she's, she's, excuse me, she's at home, but, but Mary, her cousin, Mary, Jesus' mother, comes while Mary is also pregnant and the two women meet. And John leaps within his mother's womb, right? You remember that part? Elizabeth, in awe, she waits in awe. That the child in her recognizes the Messiah. Who am I? That the mother of my Lord would come to me. She waits in awe. She waits incredulous almost that this could happen to her. We can wait chasten. We can wait humble like Zechariah. We can wait in awe like Elizabeth. How do you wait? We can wait like John. Turning flips. Celebrating. <laughs> rejoicing. Leaping. That the Savior comes. How do you wait? We can wait like Simeon. Remember Simeon? He's in the temple. Simeon, an old, old, old man. He'd waited, well, he'd waited not just for Advent. He'd not just waited for a year. He had waited his entire life. Could you wait that long? Could you wait that patiently? He shows us how to wait. He waits because it had been revealed to him by an angel that he would not see death until he saw the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Can you wait like Simeon for the Christ child? Because when Simeon sees the Christ, he rejoices and says, Now, Lord, I may depart in peace. Peace. Can you wait with peace? even in the face of your death, right? In some way, he knew death was around the corner when he met the Messiah. And yet he could enter into that reality in peace because he'd seen the Lord. Wait, yeah, wait like Zechariah. Chasten, hopeful, in faith now, not in doubt anymore. Wait like Elizabeth with all John and celebration. Simeon, your whole life long, in peace, waiting like Anna, that prophetess who was also in the temple. You remember Anna? I have a daughter named Anna. Mm -hmm. Anna's the only, only person in any of those nativity or early um, uh, narratives of Jesus' life who recognizes the Savior without being visited by an angel. At least it's you know, revealed to us. She's the only one that sees Jesus and recognizes him immediately. And do you know what characterized Anna's life as she waited? Prayer. Prayer. The description of Anna is that she prayed day and night in the temple. Can you wait in prayer this Advent? Or maybe like, maybe like Mary. I mean, Mary's representative of all of God's people. 
She is representative of Israel. She is representative of the world. She is archetypal of every Christian. Of course, we all need to wait like Mary. Mary, who waits <laughs> in humility. Mary, who waits in obedience. Mary, who waits with love. Mary, who waits as a servant of the Lord who surrenders to the will of her God. Can you wait? Wait like Mary. Uh, Advent's about waiting. <clears throat> we all get distracted this time of the year. But just look at the kids, because they'll bring you back to the main thing. But I also want to invite you right now, this Advent, this week, today, tomorrow, Tuesday, to begin to carve out some times where you can wait with intention. Where you can cultivate repentance, where you can cultivate awe, where you can cultivate celebration, where you can wait in faith, where you can wait in prayer, when you can wait like all God's people have waited for centuries and centuries. You can experience just a little bit of that peace that comes from the Lord. Can you, can you learn to wait as you sit in the car line waiting for the bell to ring and your children to come out of school. Or maybe from the opposite end of that, can you wait in the classroom waiting for the school day to be over? Can you wait, um, you know, in the morning over a cup of coffee or tea or, or over breakfast in the stillness of that light as, as it begins to break through the darkness? Can you wait at the close of day as you pull the covers up tight and sink down into the pillow? Can you, can you carve out some particular moments where you can practice the art of waiting. Maybe one thing you could do during that time is memorize that little piece of Psalm 130. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in His Word, I hope. More than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. My soul waits. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat>
time we need to practice waiting. Um, but I don't know, this, I think this song helps me to recognize that it's not just me that I need to train to wait better, but I can also play some role in directing people to that main thing, that main one, Christ who comes and who will bring goodness and life. Because as I wait and learn to wait, I can be like the night wind who whispers to the little lamb. Or the little lamb who says something to the shepherd boy, the shepherd boy who speaks to the mighty king, or the mighty king who tells all people everywhere that one comes, that we can wait for him together and receive even now his goodness and love. It's a great season. It's the beginning of the year. It's how it starts. Today is the first day of the year. So as you go to that work for the rest of the year, uh, waiting may be like sin your whole life long. Pray that the hands of Christ will tend your wounds and that the Holy Spirit will bring to mind just the things you need to hear. Pray that you will rest assured that the Father will raise you up into his everlasting arms at the last. Amen. Amen.